Hi, and thanks for tuning in to Off the Page. Uh, I'm Leslie Choice. My guest today is Stuart McLean of CBC Radio fame, but he, he's also a, a storyteller at heart. And he has a book out called Home from the Vinyl Cafe. Welcome to the show. Hi. Good, Good to have here. you here. When did you start telling stories? I don't. I think I began as a journalist when I, you know, it's Sunday morning on CBC Radio. But there, I do remember uh, when I was a little guy. That's what I was looking for. I mean, it's got to go way back. Well, yeah. we, I used to hold church services in the living room, and uh, I'd, I'd draw the living room curtains closed, and I would get between the window and the, and the curtains, and we'd uh, set up bridge chairs, and some of the neighbors would come in and sit there, and I would appear out of the uh, out of the <laughs> curtains, and I would give a sermon and we would sing hymns, and then the best part is I'd take up a collection. Uh, and keep the money? And keep the money, yeah, but my mother, uh, my mother, I don't remember this, but my mother tells me that after a few services, she started to give the neighbors buttons as they came in the houses, in Ooh. the house, so that they would they'd put buttons in the collection tray. So was this because you were truly like a very religious kind of a kid, or was no, there something I, Well, I do it? remember, I went to Sunday school, and yeah. I remember... Did you have the pins? No. Attendance no. pins? No, I didn't have no those. No attendance what, pins? What, what, I was Presbyterian. <laughs> I didn't have <laughs> they, those they didn't Presbyterian. Do it. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, um, and I remember, yeah, I remember being quite taken, but I think I was taken with the sermons. Yeah. You know, I think I liked the part about the sermon in church and standing in the... The other day I was in uh, Nanaimo and we, I was reading and I, uh, I read in a church and I actually read from the pulpit and it felt like coming home. <laughs> I felt like, wow. it felt like the first time, I, it was the first time I'd ever told a story from the pulpit and it felt good. Yeah, well that's where you, as a kid, maybe you first hear those oratory skills, you know, yeah. someone sort of uh, spouting forth with uh, great language and, yeah. and loud vocabulary and all that yeah. sort of thing. What about writing them down? Not, uh, that, that goes to school. I, I do remember once, and, and I wasn't a great student, you know, I flunked grade 11, I, no. I, took, an, I took an extra year through university, uh, but I do remember once in grade 7 writing a description of a, uh, of a, a cabin in the woods and Stephen Kerrigan, who was in my, sitting over by the corner, I came back and I think I did well on this thing. Uh, and, and Kerrigan turned over to me and said, you didn't write that. And, and I remember, I mean, I remember to, today still, and I, and I remember being very determined to show him that it was my writing. And I wanted to take him up to my cottage and show him the, 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 uh, the wreck cabin to prove that you know, wow. such a thing was there. So I guess writing was always important to me. I mean, that, uh, that was an important moment. Yeah. Now, are you always listening for other people's stories still? I know this new book is fiction, but it, it, it sounds very much like the nonfiction that you wrote before it. Well, I, uh, I'm, I listen more for stories when I, when, I have, uh, when I got the deadline going. You know, when I know I need another story and I don't have one, I start listening all the time and, and, and I hear little bits and pieces. But I don't, if the stories come, when the stories come from reality, it's not the complete story. It doesn't ever land on my desk from, with beginning, middle, and end. What happens is I usually get a one sentence fragment that is enough to launch the story. Yeah. Uh, Alice Munro talks about how, how when she writes, there's a key idea, which is the furnace of the, of the story. And, and then she builds a house around that furnace, and then she puts people in the rooms of the house. And, and I, uh, I t I'll get one little idea, mine are more narratively driven, I think, than her ideas, and they're not quite as uh, important as her ideas. But I, for, I was in, uh, um, uh, in Winnipeg the other day signing the new book, and a, a young girl came up to me, and she was, uh, and I, I was a 14-year-old girl, and I was engaging her in that kind of awkward conversation you try and engage pe with. And, and, and I was asking what grade she was in, does she play sports, do you play a musical instrument, I said. And she said, well, not, not since I got my saxophone caught in my braces. <laughs> and and I, that, you know, went into the book and I, I had yeah. my little notebook and that, that could, uh, you know, a story could arise out of that. That's it, it's just delivered. It's yeah. right there, you knew it, the light bulb went yeah. on. Do you get a kind of a, a, a tingle or something when you're in the presence of a really great character or yeah. even a great story or yeah. a great Yeah, in, in Minnedosa, I met, or no, Nipawa, Manitoba, I uh, met the chap who runs the local bowling alley, Larry, yes. Larry Evans, and he brought me back to the bowling alley, and, and he was telling me about stuff. And he, he, he said, you know, I wish you were staying in, in town long enough to meet Nestor. Nestor, and I said, who was Nestor? Well, he, Nestor, he said, he'd take you out if you had some time. He'd take you out into the prairie behind his house, and he likes to go there in his pickup truck. And I said, oh, yeah, what's he do? He says, well, he puts the truck into reverse, and he takes his foot off the accelerator and his hands off the wheels, and he just lets it drive around the prairie wherever it, wa he wa it wants to go. And, and I said, uh, well, how long does he do that for? And, and, and Larry said, well, about 
about the time it takes to drink a case of beer. Which would uh, be? <laughs> probably <laughs> in two hours. And, uh, and then he told me about Nestor's first trip to Florida. And he said that when they'd never, Nestor had never been out of uh, Deloraine before. And when he got to Florida, he ran down to the beach and he lay on his back in the beach and he made a snow angel in the sand, the Florida beach. And I thought, well, well that's something that I'm going to use one that's day. Yeah. But you're going to fictionalize Nestor, right? Uh, well, I don't know if I'll fictionalize Nestor, but certainly someone will lie down on the beach someday and make a snow angel. That's just so, yeah. I don't know why that rings, but you ask, do I get a tingle? Yeah. You know, that just struck me as so pathetically and wonderfully Canadian, Canadian. <laughs> to, to go to Florida and make a snow angel. <laughs> and Something sand. familiar. Um, how important is storytelling in our lives? Obviously, you know, you're the guy who goes out looking for it and, and nailing it down here and there, but, but in what ways does stories, do stories shape our lives and who we are? I don't know if they, oh, who, I was going to say, I don't know whether they shape us, but they come in handy sometimes, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're late or in trouble, if you can spin a good yarn uh, yeah. convincingly. How important are they to shape us? I think, I mean, I think maybe the nonfiction stories shape us more than the fiction, perhaps. I mean, mm -hmm. the journalism, uh, if it's done well, it's, it's uh, it, um, and the, the sort of stuff that CBC Radio does, the things that we're doing now, where, we're, where, where people from different regions of the country get to hear the stories of each other's stories, and it helps. Uh, uh, the, the, the stories of professional sport, professional and amateur sport, you know, all of those stories that we buy into that, that help create, uh, that give us a sense of place and that give us a sense of belonging, mm -hmm. um, I think are very important. Um, you sound like you're a kind of Canadian nationalist. Yeah. Do you consider yourself such? I, it's funny because I'm not, I don't like nationalism. There was a, there was a time actually before I had children that I, did, I wouldn't stand up for the national anthem at, at, at sports events. And, uh, but then when I, uh, uh, when I had my kids, it, it was almost too, com it, it seemed when they were young, too complex to explain to them why I wasn't, because uh, it was hard for me to even explain it to myself. Um, so I don't like nationalism, because I don't, see, I don't think nationalism has done a lot of good in this, our world. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but Canadian nationalism, I kind of think in its own quiet way, it's, I do, I am a Canadian nationalist. I mean, I, I do think we have uh, a different place here. You know, I, I, I like Canada. I like what Canada stands for. I like the things we believe in. I like our geography. Our, I like our, our history. I like our weather. And so uh, I'm proud to be Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> and that was such a Canadian answer you gave me. No, I'm with you in the, in the sense that I, I dislike nationalism, but there's something about uh, identifying in very positive ways with the country, especially when it comes down to the, the storytelling and the people level, yeah. that, that's worth preserving. So yeah, we, we end up sort of talking around that and then saying ultimately maybe I guess we are I mean, I mean, when you say yeah. nationalism, I mean, I, 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 am I a Canadian? If Canadian nationalism means taking the flag and, and, and marching down to America with a flag over my shoulder to say we do it better, no. no. You know, I'm no. not a Canadian nationalist. To, to, if Canadian nationalism means I like the place I live, and I think that, that the people I live with, and I'm talking about those of us who live in Canada, that we have a shared experience and, we, and that we have muddled our way through to finding important things that we believe in together and we stand for and that we're ready to do it towards the common cause, then I say, then, I'm, then yes, you know, I, I, I'm happy to belong to this little group. All right. I hear Stuart McLean coming from behind the curtain there, the, the little kid coming out giving the speech. That was cool. All right. Uh, but you've shifted now from telling other people's stories to writing pure fiction. Mm. W where was the, the door sure. there? Well, I've been a I started as a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, um, I, be I, I worked for about uh, seven years doing radio documentaries. Hard news, you know, covering elections, covering court cases for Sunday morning. And uh, I think I, that's where I learned my craft of writing. Uh, then I worked for five years doing a personal column for Zosky on Morningside. I'd, and I was doing journalism in that they were true stories. Very but subjective. It, but they were, yeah, it was all through my eyes and it was all stuff that I decided was important. It wasn't stuff off the front pages. And I think I learned, I found my voice there. And then I started the radio show, The Vinyl Cafe, and then I started writing and making them up. At first it was really hard. Mm. At first, I, uh, I was so, the journalism training was so ingrained that I'd get a story idea, 
and then I'd go and research it. I'd go and interview people and take notes. Just you don't have to do that. You can just make it up. Well, I was, I, my, my imagination was under the shackles of journalism, kind of the journalism, the shackle, the journalistic shackles. But I, uh, it slowly, it's, it's kind of, it loosened, and I feel more comfortable sort of uh, mining my imagination than mining the world around me. Of course, my imagination is fueled by the world around me, so it all, it's all really, th that's the interesting thing, is you start realizing it's, the same, it's all the same, that, that fiction and nonfiction, it's all really the same. It all goes through your filter. It's all storytelling, and it's just where you do your research. Do you research your, your, your imagination, your history, or are you researching somebody else's with a notebook? And you find that you're doing a little bit of both in either genre. Yeah. Introduce me to Dave. There's Dave and Morley, central characters yeah. here. Who is Dave? Well, Dave, the Vinyl Cafe is, uh, the conceit of the radio show is that the music comes from this second-hand record store. It's a record store where you can, own, you know, where you just, they just sell you vinyl. We may not be big, but we're small. That's the motto, yeah. yeah. We yeah. may not be big, but we're small is Dave's motto. Dave, uh, Dave's from Cape, and he runs the joint, and he, his, uh, the stories revolve around this place the people who go there, people like Kenny Wong, who runs Wong Scottish Meat Pies, which is the restaurant down the street, and Dave's family, uh, his wife and his two kids. Uh, he's a guy in his 40s. Uh, he, uh, he, he made a lot of money in the early days of rock and roll. He comes from Cape Breton, and he uh, traveled around with all sorts of rock and roll groups and, uh, and uh, put some money in the bank, and now, he, uh, now he's running this little record store. and uh, uh, He doesn't have a lot of ambition anymore, but he's a good soul. He's not a... Uh, He's not uh, he, enough ambition to keep it going and to raise a nice family. Yeah, he's kind of kind of an everyman in a way. The, yeah, the feeling I, I get from him. What about Morley? What's she like? Uh, she's. You get the feeling that she drives the bus in the family. That Morley uh, keeps things going. That she. Uh, that, but she loves her husband very much. I mean, she's quite uh, happy to be and considers herself lucky to be living with this bit of a flake. I think. Um, but uh, she keeps. Dave keeps kind of. Morley seems to be going down the road, uh, probably with the kids in the car, and Dave is kind of running around the car, trying to get in the door and, uh, and, then, and, and stepping off. Dave's the kind of guy that gets out at the, uh, at the toll booth to pick up the quarter that Morley has thrown into the toll booth, and it's bounced off. And, and while he gets out of the car to pick it up, Morley throws another quarter in and drives off and leaves Dave standing at the toll booth, and he has to, he has to deal with it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of these minor catastrophes yeah, in, there in there. Are, are these minor catastrophes sort of the, uh, the, the great adventures of, of our lives? Huh. They're certainly, are they the great adventures of our lives? They're certainly the, what, they're the things you remember. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the if things you're sitting, that go wrong. It's the, th when you, and it's also, you can, you can go on grand trips and you can do great work and, I mean, you can write a, a book or you can make a movie or you can do all of this jazz. But when you, when, it, when you sit down to talk with your friends or when you sit at the table or at supper time uh, and have a glass of wine and start telling stories, you, you don't talk about that stuff. You talk about, uh, you talk about the night you forgot to de thaw the turkey and you, just before Christmas dinner and, you, and you've got the hair dryer out or the electric blanket trying to thaw the turkey in time for Christmas dinner. I mean, those are the sort of things that people remember that, and that people like to remember and people like to laugh and talk about. And a lot of them are those family stories too, aren't they? Things yeah. related to the, the disasters and families and kids and all yeah. that kind of thing. Well, in the book, the book it is, yeah, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things seem to go wrong in Dave's life with his family. But I, I think maybe the appeal of Dave and Morley and, and the family that they're in is that they, a lot of things do go wrong, but they seem to uh, uh, deal with them with humor and grace, and they seem to muddle their way through yes. in, a, in a kind of, and uh, maybe a way that we all kind of hope that we can do. Okay, uh, thanks for that, sir. We're going to take a short break right now, and we'll be back with Stuart McLean here on Off the Page right after this. Hi, welcome back to Off the Page. I'm here today with Stuart McLean. We're talking about Home from the Vinyl Cafe, his new book, but fact and fiction both together. You've traveled a lot in this country, Stuart. I just saw you in Vancouver a while ago. Yeah. Do you I'm like traveling? Uh, yeah, I, I don't mind traveling. I mean, it's getting a little, uh, I'm, uh, I've done a big hop this week, you know, from yeah. Vancouver and stopping in Kingston and uh, 
now, now to Halifax and on to Newfoundland. Does everybody have a story to tell you? No. They don't do that, huh? No, they do it sometimes. <laughs> but, um, there's, uh, uh, but there's not, uh, you know, people don't recognize me a lot, you know, so, and people, uh, occasionally people um, <clears throat> have stories and, uh, uh, and occasionally the stories are worth writing down. You know? That's because you look different from the way you look on radio. Yeah, that's... <laughs> um, a place that, that I uh, noticed, though, that was very important to you, that you visited in Canada, Dresden, Ontario. Mm, Tell yeah. me about Dresden, Dresden, Ontario. That was for Welcome Home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I ch Welcome Home was a book. What I was trying to do with Welcome Home was, was make a quilt of Canada, you know, paint a picture of Canada which would just tell the story of the country, and I was doing it through seven small towns. And so I chose the seven small towns very carefully. You know, I, um, uh, Fairyland and Newfoundland, uh, uh, just dangling off the Avalon Peninsula, and uh, with Nacusp, a logging town on the other side of the country. And each, each town added to the quilt uh, certain, certain squares that coming together would paint Canada. Dresden is in Ontario, and it's in tomato country. It's just flat flat, flat, flatter than the prairie with the fields crowding the roads of these tomato plants. It looks like the fields, in fact, sometimes you're below the fields when you're driving through the country, like they're going to overflow with dirt and tomato the road. And uh, Dresden, the most interesting thing about Dresden to me was that it was the home of a lot of slave uh, uh, men and women who came up to Canada on the Underground Railroad. It was one of those end points, and most interestingly, it was uh, uh, the, the place that a, a guy by the name of Josiah Henson a ended up. And Josiah Henson was a, a remarkable man when he, when he was a black man. Uh, and when he got to uh, Dresden, he began the British American Institute, which was kind of like a, uh, oh, uh, a camp, a, a community, like a commune for uh, blacks to come and these ex-slaves to come and to, to, to educate themselves, to get jobs, and to get themselves started in this new life. And Henson is uh, um, said to be by many the, uh, 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 um, the character on whom Harriet Beecher Stowe based her oh, right, yes. uh, novel Uncle Tom's mm -hmm. Cabin. So you have this layer of history in Dresden of, of black history and these very pr great black men and women coming there. Uh, and then you peel that layer, and Dresden paints itself. You know, come to Dresden, Ontario, the home of Uncle Tom, and there's the Uncle Tom Museum and all this jazz. Well, then you peel that layer off, and you find that, that Dresden in the 50s was the home of, of great racism in Canada, that black people who lived in Dresden couldn't go to the barber, couldn't go to the pool room, wouldn't be served in any of the restaurants. They had to drive to Chatham to get their hair cut. And uh, the, the, so bad was it that, uh, it, it, uh, the National Film Board came to Dresden and made a, a film about Dresden. Um, the, they went to a, a great hero, a young carpenter by the name of Hugh Burnett, w w went to, uh, kept going to uh, Toronto with a bunch of other uh, uh, black men and women from that town of Dresden and petitioning the Frost government. That you have to do something about this, he said. You know, it can't go on. And it was their agitation and the, and the input of the press and, and the National Film Board that caused the fair Practices and Accommodations Act, which uh, was passed in Ontario, finally um, uh, making it illegal not to serve people for race, color, or creed. Uh, so to have these two, and that's this is a story that's not well told in Canada. Yes. You know, we like yeah, to go around in Canada well and say that mm. we're, you know, we look at the states and we say, we're not like that. We're, know, we're not racist. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we have a much, uh, we, uh, that's not part of our history. Well, it was part of our history. It was a huge part of our history. I mean, we weren't the Deep South, yeah. and we weren't South Africa, but we, we weren't perfect either. We were, and we were a long way from perfect, and we continue to be a long way from perfect, a long way from perfect. And I think until, and the reason I chose Dresden was that until we as Canadians recognize what our history was, who we were, because it, was, it wasn't only in Dresden that that, that was going on. It was no mm -hmm. mistake that the, uh, you know, a young, the, the lieutenant governor of Ontario, the uh, um, Lincoln Alexander, and my friend uh, Judge Stanley Grizel, who lives up the street from me. These are distinguished and elegant and eloquent men. They all, what, what did they do when they were young men? They worked as railroad porters. How come? Because that's the only job you could get as a black guy in, in, in the 40s and 50s in Canada, or unless you wanted to work in a hotel. Wow. So we have to... Uh, um, we have to acknowledge that as a country and say, okay, that's who we were. We're not that anymore. We don't believe that. But we were that, and it was part of us. 
and uh, and then I think we can we can be, get better at what we're trying to do now. So that's why I chose Dress. That's interesting. What about now when you're still traveling out across the country? Do you ever see something in the midst of sort of looking for your stories and talking about your books and things like that? Do you see things that still make you really mad, angry, things that are going wrong that that Architecture. shouldn't be? Architecture. <laughs> I'm looking. I was in. Uh, uh, Montreal yesterday. Oh yeah, and Bad I was looking at the old. Yeah, I feel like Prince Charles. Yeah, you know, I was looking mm -hmm. at all those gray stone buildings. I was in the Sun Life Building. This, what was once the biggest building in the Commonwealth, this magnificent gray stone building, and and I was trying to imagine there was a bank opposite and an old bank, and I was trying to imagine the city as it would have looked before all of these ugly concrete towers were put up. I mean, I I think some of the tall glass towers are beautiful, but there was a time in the 60s and 70s where they, this prefab concrete stuff uh, that just, I was in Melbourne, Australia, uh, which is a town where a lot of the Victorian architecture has been allowed to stay. I mean, we have this notion of Australia being this beer-swilling uh, um, bunch of bruises that uh, uh, you'd never want to spend time with. Well. Man, we could learn a lot about architecture from Melbourne, Australia, and, and you get an idea of what a city like Toronto might have looked like today had they not gutted it and uh, uh, replaced all of that beautiful stuff with some right. of the ugliness of the city. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, so I, I yeah, architecture these days, I tend to be, uh, uh, that I look around at some of the, uh, universities, McGill University, these beautiful buildings, and then they, bam, in 1960 or 70, they put down this, we, we could spend a lot of time knocking down buildings and replacing them, and, 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 not, and it wouldn't be a bad life. Yeah. We'd, be a con we'd, be, we'd be contributing. Um, you must be a very skilled observer. Is this something you trained yourself in? Or you know, what, what do you do when you go out there with your perceptions? Obviously, you're listening for the stories. But what else is going on? What are you looking for? What details? Mostly, I'm looking for the, the, the washroom or where I can get a, <laughs> a, a cup of coffee or if there's a cart for my luggage. Uh, I think, I don't think I'm a particularly skilled observer. I think uh, that when I'm working on my stories, I know it's my job. You know, when I'm going to write a story, going to write a story, I, 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 I know that I need details and I look for details. Yeah. I think I learned that as a radio journalist because on the radio, you have to you translate, don't you? You have to from the eye to, to the ear. Yeah, you have to be able to, when you're telling a story on the radio, as I used to do, you have to be able to. Creating a sense of place is very important. You can't tell a story unless you put the story in a place. It works a lot better if people can imagine where this story is happening. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, my guest is Stuart McLean. We're going to take a very short break and be back in a minute. I've been watching off the page. My guest is Stuart McLean. Stuart, final big turkey question. It's Thanksgiving. You were supposed to buy the turkey. You didn't. You run down to the store. You get the last frozen turkey. It's got to be cooked today. What do you do? Uh, you, you, you thaw it out with an electric blanket, a uh, hair dryer. You drink a lot of scotch. Actually, you know, that story, which is the opening story in the book, it's, it is based on truth. What happened I'm was, sure we, it was we bought the turkey for a big dinner party, and the oven was broken and we took it to the hotel. Uh, you t you, what you do is you take the turkey to the hotel where they got the convection oven. You, br you, you give the guy a present, and he cooks it there in 45 minutes. You're home free. There it is. You heard it here <laughs> first. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. And thanks for watching Off the Page. I'll see you next time.